a majestic double-decker aircraft that can carry more than 525 passengers in one trip. It's the king of the skies. Airbus A380 is powered by four Rolls-Royce Trent 900 engines with enough thrust to lift over 1.2 million pounds straight into the air. It is not only great for moving crowds across continents, but also for giving passengers a smoother ride with less turbulence than most jets in the world. But the strange thing is, no US airline ever bought it. Why did the world's largest passenger plane never wear the colors of Delta, United, or American? the majestic aircraft itself. You see, the Airbus A380 wasn't supposed to exist. Airlines were worried that it was too big, and airports were panicking about infrastructure costs. Yet Airbus built it anyway, and what emerged is nothing short of extraordinary. At 238 feet long with a wingspan bigger than a football field, the A380 shattered every assumption about what a passenger plane could be. But what really stops people in their tracks is that it can pack 853 passengers into a single flight. That's more people than live in most small American towns all cruising at 40,000 feet. The engineering behind this beast is equally amazing. Four massive engines are used, each generating 70,000 pounds of thrust. These somehow lift 1.2 million pounds of metal, fuel, and humanity into the sky. No matter how many times you watch it take off, it will still defy the logic of how something that enormous gets airborne. The physics alone should make it impossible. Yet here it is, climbing effortlessly toward the sky. What Airbus achieved in noise control deserves appreciation here. Step inside an A380, and you would swear you were in a luxury hotel lobby, not an aircraft. The cabin noise is at whisper levels. It is 5 to 10 decibels quieter than traditional wide bodies. That might sound insignificant to you, but anyone who has tried holding a conversation on a Boeing 777 over the Pacific understands the difference. Flight attendants can speak normally instead of shouting. Passengers can actually sleep. The real magic is in the details most travelers never notice. Cabin pressure is set to simulate 6,000 feet instead of the industry standard 8,000 feet. Your body can feel the difference, even if your brain cannot explain explain why you arrive less exhausted. The advanced wing design absorbs turbulence like a luxury sedan soaking up road bumps. Physics works differently up there when you have that much aircraft around you. Airlines went absolutely wild with the possibilities. Emirates installed onboard showers. Singapore Airlines created private suites with sliding doors. Etihad pushed boundaries further with three-room residences complete with personal butlers. These airline seats became flying hotel rooms. The A380 gave carriers nearly 6,000 square feet of cabin space to work with, and they use every inch. But why did Airbus really Really release this version. Well, they knew something that airlines were just beginning to grasp. Major airports were drowning in demand. Heathrow, JFK, and Tokyo Haneda were bottlenecks strangling global travel. Runway slots were worth millions. Gate space had become more valuable than real estate in Manhattan. The A380 offered an elegant solution. Instead of adding more flights, pack more passengers into each departure. The strategy seemed bulletproof. Hub airports loved the efficiency. Passengers raved about the experience. Aviation enthusiasts called it the future of long-haul travel. Everything pointed towards success. But then, no U.S. airline purchased a single aircraft. Why is that? Why U.S. airlines said no? The Airbus A380 should have been irresistible to U.S. airlines. Here was an aircraft that was offering luxury travel, packing more passengers than any plane in history, and creating limitless revenue opportunities. Still, every major American carrier took one look at the numbers and walked away. They did not reject the aircraft for what it was. Anyone who stepped aboard an A380 understood immediately why passengers loved it. The problem was far more fundamental. Airbus had built the perfect airplane for a world that didn't exist in America. Two competing philosophies were battling for aviation's future in the early 2000s. Airbus envisioned a world choking on airport congestion. Mega hubs like Heathrow and Charles de Gaulle would funnel massive streams of passengers through fortress-like terminals. Their solution was to build bigger planes to move more people per takeoff. The A380 was their masterpiece for this hub-and-spoke future. Boeing read the tea leaves completely differently. Their research suggested passengers were growing tired of connecting through crowded hubs when they could fly direct. The future belonged to point-to-point -point travel. They predicted that America needed smaller, more efficient aircraft that could profitably serve routes no jumbo jet could touch. They were betting everything on this vision with the 787 Dreamliner. The U.S. airlines didn't just prefer Boeing's approach. Their entire business model depended on it. U.S. carriers had carefully spread their operations across multiple hubs. United operated major centers in Newark, Houston, Denver, and San Francisco. Delta commanded Atlanta while maintaining significant operations in Detroit, Minneapolis, and Seattle. American had built around Dallas, Miami, Phoenix, and Charlotte. This distributed strategy had served them brilliantly, but it created an A380 problem. No single U.S. hub generated the kind of sustained, ultra-high demand routes that could fill 550 seats every single day. Even on popular transatlantic runs like New York to London, passenger demand fluctuated wildly between seasons, days of the week, and economic conditions.
Finance. The A380 needed consistent, overwhelming demand to make financial sense. The economics were even more brutal than the route planning. Four engines meant quadruple the maintenance headaches of twin-engine competitors. A 380 fuel costs alone could exceed the total operating expenses of a 787 on equivalent routes. In an industry where profit margins lived and died by single percentage points, that math was too much to handle here. But the real killer was infrastructure. The A380 demanded Code F airport classification. This means wider taxiways, reinforced concrete, specialized gates with multiple boarding bridges, and ground equipment that could handle its massive bulk. Most U.S. airports simply were not built for this. Even major international gateways like Chicago O'Hare remained largely incompatible throughout the A380's production run. JFK could handle it at Terminal 4, but barely. Los Angeles required millions in upgrades before foreign A380 services could begin operations. Miami, despite its massive Latin American traffic, never fully adapted. For U.S. carriers eyeing the A380, this meant accepting severe route limitations before they even took delivery. The timing couldn't have been worse. Between 2005 and 2015, American aviation was convulsing through the most dramatic consolidation in its history. Delta absorbed Northwest. United merged with Continental. American eventually combined with U.S. Airways. These acquisitions were survival mergers in the true sense. The main reasons behind them were bankruptcy, debt crises, and the trauma of September 11th. Airline executives were focused on integration nightmares, not experimental aircraft purchases. They needed planes that could serve multiple routes, adapt to changing demand, and operate efficiently even when seats remained empty. The A380 offered none of that. What's fascinating is that even before consolidation, when the U.S. market had more carriers and theoretically more appetite for differentiation, nobody bit. Continental evaluated it extensively. Northwest ran the numbers. U.S. Airways considered it briefly. Every analysis reached the same conclusion that the aircraft was magnificent but wrong for America. But that doesn't mean it was wrong for other major carriers. The 380 finally found its home far from American skies. Why Emirates loved it While U.S. Airlines treated the Airbus A380 like a mistake, Emirates saw the perfect weapon for aviation domination. Geography handed Emirates an ace that American carriers could never match. Dubai sits like a strategic bullseye between three continents. This positions Emirates within a single flight of nearly 4 billion people. From this desert crossroads, an A380 could reach London, Tokyo, Mumbai, or Johannesburg with optimal flight times and passenger loads. The aircraft was not too big for their routes. Their routes were designed for exactly this kind of capacity. But geography alone doesn't explain Emirates' obsession with A380. What sealed the deal was their ruthlessly efficient hub strategy. While American Airlines juggled multiple hubs across different continental networks, Emirates handled everything through one fortress, Dubai International Airport. This created massive rivers of passengers flowing to identical destinations at predictable times. Dubai International also rebuilt around the A380. Terminal 3 has 20 gates specifically engineered for the giant, each equipped with dual boarding bridges to handle both decks at the same time. The taxiways were widened, the runways reinforced, and the parking positions were enlarged. The infrastructure investment was massive, but it proved profitable in the end. Emirates understood that the A380 is a flying luxury resort complete with onboard showers, private suites with sliding doors, and cocktail lounges that belonged in five-star hotels. Other airlines used the A380 space for more economy seats. Emirates created experiences that passengers photographed, shared on social media, and bragged about for years. Emirates was so clever to use the A380 as its brand ambassador. It became the flying advertisement for Dubai and promoted the Middle East as a luxury destination. Emirates had the financial freedom to play the long game. Unlike U.S. airlines that had to answer to shareholders, holders every few months. Emirates had government backing and could think years ahead. That meant they could pour money into building a huge A380 fleet, confident it would pay off later. In the end, they owned 123 of them, which is almost half of all A380s ever made. Right now, 116 of them are still in service. This gave them a major edge at busy airports like London Heathrow, where adding more flights was not possible. Instead, they made each flight bigger. One A380 can carry as many people as two smaller planes. This lets them grow their presence without needing more landing slots. But the sad thing is, its fall was inevitable, and everyone could see it coming. What happened to the A380? The launch of the Airbus A380 in 2005 felt like aviation's moonshot moment. Airbus bet the future on its vision of how people would travel and expected to sell over 1,200 units over two decades. The early signs looked promising. Emirates, Singapore Airlines, Qantas, and European carriers like Air France and Lufthansa lined up as launch customers. 
Then came October 2007, when Singapore Airlines operated the maiden commercial flight from Singapore to Sydney. Tickets sold at auction for over $100,000. Aviation enthusiasts treated it like a historic event. The Super Jumbo became famous worldwide, but the celebration didn't last long. The 2008 financial crisis struck aviation like a sledgehammer. Airlines that had been planning expansion suddenly faced survival mode. Jet fuel prices rocketed past $140 per barrel, turning the A380's four-engine thirst into a financial nightmare. What looked like smart capacity planning in 2005 became a crushing operational burden three years later. Airlines started delaying deliveries, renegotiating contracts, and questioning whether they really needed something so enormous. Then, Boeing delivered a knockout punch. The 787 Dreamliner, which entered service in 2011, changed everything. Here was an aircraft that could fly almost as far as an A380, but with half the engines, advanced composite construction, and fuel efficiency. Airbus scrambled to respond with its own A350, but the damage was done. Airlines discovered they could serve thin long-haul routes profitably without funneling passengers through megahubs. The point-to-point -point revolution was real, and it was devastating for the A380's business case. By 2016, production had collapsed to one aircraft per month. Airlines that had once celebrated A380 deliveries were quietly trying to offload them. Malaysia Airlines attempted to sell or lease its six A380s as early as 2015. They admitted that they couldn't fill the enormous cabins consistently. Thai Airways scaled back services. The final blow came in February 2019 when Emirates, the A380's most loyal champion, slashed its outstanding order by 39 aircraft. They were replacing A380s with smaller, more efficient A350s and A330neos. Without Emirates' massive volume, the economy collapsed entirely. Airbus announced production would end in 2021 after just 251 aircraft. It was only a fraction of their original dreams. The program was dying already, and then COVID-19 delivered the funeral. When the pandemic hit in March 2020, international travel virtually disappeared. The A380, which needed hundreds of passengers per flight to make financial sense, became aviation's biggest liability. By April 2020, roughly 90% of the world's A380 fleet sat in desert storage facilities. Airlines raced to retire them permanently. Air France dumped all 10 A380s in June 2020. Lufthansa parked its 14 aircraft. Qatar Airways called them environmentally unsustainable and walked away from the type entirely. Etihad grounded its fleet and hasn't brought them back since. Even Emirates, with 116 A380s, parked most of its fleet. Aviation analysts declared victory for the critics. But then, something extraordinary happened. As travel demand roared back in late 2021, airlines faced an unexpected problem. They couldn't get new aircraft delivered fast enough. Supply chains were devastated. Boeing and Airbus had years-long backlogs. Suddenly, those parked A380s looked valuable again. They could restore capacity instantly on the world's busiest routes. The resurrection was quite quick. British Airways brought back all 12 A380s by 2022. Qantas returned them to the Sydney Los Angeles and Sydney London routes. Lufthansa restored A380 service to New York and Boston. Korean Air kept flying them across the Pacific. Even Singapore Airlines, renowned for fleet efficiency, maintained A380 zero operations to London and Sydney. Passenger sentiment drove part of this revival. Surveys consistently showed travelers loved the A380 experience, the quietness, the space, the stability. Some actively sought out A380 flights. This turned the aircraft into a marketing advantage rather than a burden. The comeback has limits, though. Production ended forever in December 2021 with the final delivery to Emirates. The global fleet will inevitably shrink as aircraft age and airlines transition to newer technology. But for now, seeing an A380 remains special. Now the question is, how is the U.S. managing without the A380? The short answer is, American carriers built their entire international strategy around a completely different kind of aircraft. Instead of going big, they went efficient and flexible. The U.S. strategy Without the A380, the big three American carriers made a bet on twin-engine efficiency over four-engine choice. They embraced aircraft like the Boeing 787 Dreamliner and Airbus A350. These are the planes that can fly almost as far as an A380 while burning 20-25% to less fuel per passenger. More importantly, these aircraft could turn a profit even when half empty something the A380 never managed. The Boeing 787 became their weapon of choice for international travel. When United became the first North American carrier to fly it in 2012, they immediately started connecting cities that would never justify A380 service. Denver to Tokyo, Houston to Sydney, 
San Francisco to Chengdu. These are not the routes you can serve with a 550-seat giant. They are perfect for a 250-seat aircraft that can fill up reliably. This opened up possibilities that A380 operators could never match. Instead of forcing passengers through massive hub-and-spoke bottlenecks, U.S. carriers could offer direct flights from secondary cities to international destinations. A businessman in Denver doesn't have to connect through Los Angeles to reach Tokyo anymore. A family in Houston can fly non-stop to Australia. The 787 made these routes economically viable for the first time. U.S. carriers also perfected true multi-hub flexibility. Each hub of each carrier serves different geographic regions and passenger flows, but none needs to fill a giant aircraft every single day. This distribution creates enormous competitive advantages. Advantages. If one market softens, airlines can shift capacity to stronger routes quickly. If demand surges somewhere unexpected, they can add frequencies without the massive financial commitment of deploying an A380. The flexibility is worth more than any individual aircraft's capabilities. The economics tell the whole story. An A7879 might carry 290 passengers compared to an A380's 550, but it needs far fewer passengers to break even. Airlines can operate profitably at 70% load factors, while A380's typically need 80% or higher just to cover costs. In volatile markets where demand fluctuates so much, this difference determines whether routes survive or are canceled. Technical advances made this strategy even more powerful. ETOP certification states the rules governing how far twin-engine aircraft can fly from diversion airports. It evolved to allow 330-minute ratings. This meant 787s and A355s could safely cross vast oceanic expanses that once required four engines. One of the A380's few technical advantages simply vanished. U.S. carriers also discovered they could offer better passenger experiences without enormous aircraft. The 787's composite fuselage allows lower cabin pressure equivalent to 6,000 feet altitude instead of the typical 8,000 feet. Passengers arrive less fatigued. Higher humidity levels prevent the usual airplane dryness. Advanced air filtration systems keep cabin air fresher. The A350 delivers similar improvements. So, the A380's comfort advantages are not so unique anymore. Today's U.S. long-haul market proves the strategy worked brilliantly. Delta United and American collectively serve more international destinations than any A380 operator ever could. They offer multiple daily frequencies on major routes, giving passengers more scheduling options. They can enter new markets without massive financial risks. They have built networks that adapt to changing demand rather than requiring it. The result is a system that thrives on diversity. U.S. airlines maintain fleets mixing 767s, 777s, 7877s, A330s, and A3507s, a 200-seat leisure flight to Barbados. Barbados uses different equipment than a 350-seat premium service to Tokyo, and both operate profitably. Now tell us, have you ever flown on the mighty Airbus A380? If so, share your experience with us in the comments below. And before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss the latest aviation updates. We will keep you in the loop. Goodbye for now.